The world is an increasingly urban place. About 80% of Americans live in and around cities, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. And with urban living comes traffic, noise, pollution, and other hassles of daily life that can exact a toll on our mental health. But cities don't have to wear us down. Psychologists who study urban design and mental health say that by incorporating elements like access to nature, opportunities for exercise, and spaces that encourage community, it's possible to design urban areas that support our mental health and well-being. So how does our physical environment affect our mental health? What aspects of city design matter most? Are there cities doing an especially good job of designing for mental health? And if so, what can other cities learn from them? And what about issues of equity and access? How can cities ensure that all residents have access to the kinds of spaces that promote mental health? What can you do in your own community to make a difference? Welcome to Speaking of Psychology, the flagship podcast of the American Psychological Association that examines the links between psychological science and everyday life. I'm Kim Mills. My guest today is Dr. Jenny Rowe, Director of the Center for Design and Health in the School of Architecture at the University of Virginia. She's an environmental psychologist who studies the intersection of health and well being with architecture and urban design. Her research interests include creating environments that support mental health, designing cities for healthy aging and healthy child and adolescent development, and studying how nature affects health and well being. She's written numerous peer reviewed studies and two books, the most recent of which is Restorative Cities urban design for mental health and well-being. Dr. Rowe, thank you for joining me today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Pleasure to be here. So as I said, your book is called Restorative Cities. So let's start by defining that term. What constitutes a restorative city? Well, restorative cities is a term coined from a rubric of research in psychology that goes under the name of restorative environment research. Uh, a restorative environment is any environment inside or outdoors that supports your mental health. So that's where the term restorative cities originated from. What is the opposite then? What is an environment that isn't restorative? Well, a pathogenic environment, one that has toxins, one that has uh, poor air quality, uh, one that has a high level of noise pollution, um, and a, a, a grey area, an area that has no nature. Uh, it has nothing to engage our interest or our attention. Homogenous neighborhoods, neighborhoods that all look the same. That sounds quite bleak. <laughs> <laughs> you can probably picture it though. Yeah, I can, I can. Uh, the first chapter of your book is called The Green City and it's all about access to nature. How does contact with nature affect our mental health and what does nature look like in, in a city, in an urban area? Nature is possibly uh, the most restorative attributes in our environment, either indoors or out. And what's so extraordinary about nature is it provides four psychological attributes that we know support our mental health. The first is a sense of fascination. That would be a sense of curiosity and wonder and awe even. Uh, the second is a sense of an extent. Um, an extent might be defined as looking at a view from perhaps your window, looking at the mountain tops. I see mountains uh, where I work. I work in Virginia. I see the Blue Ridge Mountains. I don't know what you see from your office, but looking up and out of your environment fosters this idea of extent and, and connecting to a whole other world beyond the world you're in right now. Um, a sense of compatibility. Nature will provide us with opportunities for refuge, perhaps, or for opportunities to interact uh, with family and friends. Parks provide opportunities for play, for picnics. So it provides a lot of opportunities in terms of, of our needs and our goals in life, our social goals particularly. And then the final and possibly the most important attribute nature can provide is a sense of being away a sense of escape from our everyday stresses. And what's really important, and I'd like to stress to your um, listeners, is that contact with nature doesn't need to be in a wilderness. Contact with nature in a city can be 
on a very small scale. It can be a pocket park. It can be a balcony with plants. It can be a view to nature from your window. Direct contact, actually getting out and about in a park and moving um, physically provides a whole host of um, mental health benefits. But let's say you're a retired person or you're sick, you can't move around so easily, having a view of nature is super important. And you'd be amazed at the number of senior residences I go into where the window is above the eye level of the person actually living in that room. So there's fundamentals like that that are really important. Your book characterizes many aspects of cities. You talk about green, blue, sensory, neighborly, just to name a few. What are these various types of of cities? Why do you classify them as you do? Thematically, we thought, uh, Leila and I, who's a psychiatrist who I worked on the book with, we believed it was important to try and have these seven pillars. Not all pillars are possible, um, but most people can breathe a little bit of nature into an environment, even in a very, very small way, be it, as I said, you know, having balconies and having plants on those balconies. Some are more difficult to create. You know, neighborly cities require um, a community to really have access to some community space in which to interact. During COVID, uh, we saw how important the outdoors became to our social uh, well-being, our physical well-being, our mental health, our streets, for example, provided the context in which we interacted with our neighbours. So, we have seven pillars. They're at a different scale, and, and some are more easy to implement than others, and they all interact with each other. So, let's just give an example of that. So, access to nature provides also opportunities for social interaction and communication. And so it contributes to the neighborly city. Access to nature is also, I advocate for a human right and need. Um, and that, again, during COVID, what we saw was um, inequalities, environmental and health inequalities in access to green space in the city. Are there any cities that have all of the pillars or most of them? Can you give us some examples of some cities that are really restorative? I think it would be hard for any city to meet all of those pillars uh, through the entire population of a city. We're talking about millions of people that inhabit cities. I think an example I would quote, which is very newsworthy at the moment, is Paris. Um, so the mayor of Paris, around about COVID time, 2021, she was re-elected on an urban design mandate. And what she said she was going to give Paris was a restorative environment. She didn't use those words, but that's what I inferred from what she said. And she set about um, with an urban design manifesto that was about retaining all those pop-up streets and pop-up cycle lanes. And she is removing transport from within the center of Paris. And just today, there's been a vote in Paris, I think, to increase the amount that SUVs are charged for parking. It's going to be three times the rate of any other car because the people in Paris don't want them in their city center. Um, so, there's a lot of things happening in Paris. The other thing I'd say about Paris is they've really seized the idea that children need safe and high quality environments to walk to school to. They're creating play streets um, in the vicinity of schools. They're making access to school much more walkable and safer. It would seem to me that various cities could have these elements in different parts of them. As you mentioned, cities can be quite large. So I lived for many years in New York City, as an example. There's Central Park, but there are also parks in Brooklyn. You know, there are parks in the Bronx. There are other places. And, and of course, you're on an island, so you're near the water. You can see the water. Is New York restorative in that sense? But it's very loud. So how do these things work together? Well, I'm going to give you an example in New York. It's called Pateley Park, and it's just off a main uh, roadway, probably four or five lanes of traffic. It's right in the heart of the city, and it's flooded with water. So they have a, a screen of water rushing down one of the facades in this pocket, pocket park. You must go there next time you're in New York. And you set off and you sit there and you hear this extraordinary sound of water 
tumbling down the surface of, of the facade and it just reduces all the noise that you might hear from the street. So it's an example of a micro restorative space off a busy uh, roadway that can just help restore your mental health whilst you're on a break from work, whatever you're doing in the city. Um, so New York, I think, has fantastic examples of restorative spaces. What I'd love to do with New York, though, I, and this is controversial possibly, but Central Park you know, is one big, gigantic space. And I would love to see New York and Manhattan have an e more equal distribution of green space across its area. Well, it's so built up, it's a little hard, I mean, short of knocking down buildings. I mean, they did do the High Line, though, a number of years ago, right, which is a beautiful park that I think is very restorative in the sense that you can enjoy it, you can see nature, and you can see the buildings, you can you know, look beyond to the water. Absolutely. The High Line's a perfect example of, of, of connecting um, the tissue of a city together through the use of a, of a linear park. It's a perfect example. So you're in Charlottesville. Is that a restorative city? It's a good question. Uh, there are many times when I walk around and drive around Charlottesville and think it's very, very restorative. There are other times I think I'm in a hellscape of noise and strip malls. So I think Charlottesville has beautiful views out to the mountains, that idea of extent that I was talking about earlier. It has a lot of murals that contribute to the contributes to the sense of fascination I talked about. But Charlottesville is not a walkable city. Uh, and it could be. It could so easily be a walkable city. We have a downtown mall that's pedestrianized, um, a wonderful example of, of walkability, but it's only probably less than a mile long. So I come from the UK. I came here 2015 from a very walkable and cyclable city, which is Edinburgh in Scotland. And I thought about getting a bike in Chartsville and I did not. I was advised not to. Uh, but that was my mode of transport in the UK. So I think we could be doing better. And my students, I teach Healthy Cities to graduate students here at UVA. And they're often saying to me, Jenny, you know, the examples you're giving us are from Europe. I've just talked about Paris. I've talked about Edinburgh. They say it's not possible here in the US. And I, dispute that. I think that cities like New York, Boston, Chicago are leading the way in terms of certainly creating space for walking and cycling. And if you look at Amsterdam in the 1970s and 1960s, it was flooded with transport. They made an active decision to do something about it, just as Paris is doing right now. Now, you also write in your book about the neighborly city. How does city design influence the way that we interact with other people? How do you design places that will encourage people to be more neighborly? I'm going to go back to nature as an example. It's just one example. But there's a lot of research emerging now to show that pocket parks allow people to um, sit and stop and intermingle with one another. There's evidence to show that we have a higher sense of trust of our neighbours if we have access to pocket parks and green space and street trees. Um, there's a famous study that was done in a public park in a city which involved dropping a dollar on the pavement and they did two scenarios, one in the park and one on a busy urban street with no green space and people were much more likely to, to give the dollar back if they saw it being dropped in the park than they were on the street. So this is the kind of research that we do, um, you know, to show that these uh, values of altruism, trust, place belonging are really helped and supported by having access to green space. So nature is just one example. So how do you do more research into the mental health impacts of cities on people? Do you look at people in cities that say aren't green or blue or neighborly and compare them with people in cities that have those attributes? And is the research based on self-reports or do you use other measurement methods? So two good questions. Firstly, I'll take the measures. We do both. We ask people how they feel using self-report, validated scales from psychology. Really important to ask people how they feel, but we also try and capture 
their physiology as they're moving about through space. So we have smart watches that will capture their heart rate. We have neural headsets that will capture what's going on in people's brains as they're moving through space. Uh, we can take those kind of biometrics data and correlate it with the self-report data. And usually the two tally, not always, but really important to ask people how they feel. And then what was the first question? Do you look at people who are in, say, green or blue or neighborly cities and compare them to people who are in other non-restorative places? We do exactly that. So epidemiologists would certainly do that in public health. They would crunch public health data from neighborhoods with access to space, to green space, for instance, and parks, and those that don't. Um, in my field, we always have this kind of oppositional environment, one that's very green uh, and one that's completely gray. So, you know, we know that extremes of environment have a very strong difference on mental health outcomes. Now, I think you've found that certain types of city environments foster pro-social behavior and altruism, but I'm wondering, isn't it possible that people who are already altruistic and pro-social would go to live in these places? Well, that's an interesting question. And a lot of the research I've just referred to, particularly the large population health data, the scientists control very carefully for demographics. So they will only match like with like. So a lot of the work I did in Scotland, for instance, matched neighborhoods on very um, carefully controlled demographic variables. So people who had similar levels of income, who lived in similar types of housing. And, and you have to really control for that because, of course, richer areas have better access to higher quality green space. So most of my work doesn't look at that population. It looks at people who are poor who are living in some of the worst environments in our cities. You just talked about money. You know, there is a cost involved in making a city restorative. And I'm wondering what happens in some countries where they don't have the resources. Is it possible in some of the lower socioeconomic countries in, in the world for them to still have restorative cities? I really believe so. I've not been to South America, um, but I'm going shortly to Mexico City. Um, but I have talked to colleagues in Colombia, and they have made remarkable progress with um, the idea of cyclovia, closing a public street on a Sunday, allowing people to walk, run, play, cycle um, without access to cars. They also have some really good examples of this idea of play streets, closing a street, allowing children to play on the street at the weekend or closing a street nearby a school. So I do believe that there are some really good case studies in South America. But I think you raise a really good question because a lot of the research is done in what I would call the developed world, the Western industrialized nations with money. And we really have very little evidence of the value of restorative city attributes like nature in, let's say, um, low to middle income countries. It's changing, but it's changing very slowly. A lot of the, the um, ideas that, that you are suggesting need to be addressed on a large scale by governments and city planners. But what if people want to make some changes in their own communities? Are there things that we can do as individuals in our own neighborhood to make it more restorative? Indeed, there are. And I do work with community groups um, on some very small scale uh, insertions, micro insertions. Um, and we've demonstrated that these can improve mental health and well-being. So, for instance, in West Palm Beach, um, we did a temporary micro insertion. You can call it all sorts of things, acupuncture for cities or just a pop up for a city. We screened the noise. Um, it was a pocket space. It was next to a busy road. We put up bamboos and, and, and big planters. We provided seating. We don't have to provide very much to increase people's sense of subjective mental well-being and indeed their physiological well-being. And the results of that study are published. So I would say to people, if there's a vacant piece of land in your neighborhood, Try and come together, even if you can't change that piece of land permanently, do some kind of temporary pop-up and show how it could be used differently. And it doesn't have to be a big space. It could just be a vacant 
plot of land on a street corner. And there are, of course, restrictions on what you can do with space and you have to identify who owns it um, and get their permission to do a pop-up. But there are some really successful examples in the US of those types of pop-ups. Now, you started writing your book before the pandemic hit. Did COVID change the way people were thinking about these issues and how did you change the manuscript once the pandemic set in? So the manuscript was almost completed March 2020, and it was due with the publisher, I think, by the end of May 2020. So we were just right at the beginning of of the pandemic. And Leila and I wrote a preface to the book to adjust our thinking in light of COVID. But ultimately, what we were trying to do was really press the agenda on mental health. The book was really very timely from that perspective because there have been really good and strong directives in cities to build for mobility in the US and in Europe, you know, comfortable streets, streets that foster walking and cycling. The chief surgeon of the U.S. has spoken about this and advocated for it, but we really felt that mental health had been left out of that equation. And so the book was really um, an attempt to leverage a lot of scientific data to really put mental health higher up the agenda. COVID did that for us anyway. We all talk about mental health now. We have all experienced mental health issues because of COVID. And the stigma of mental health, I think, has declined since COVID because of the difficulties we've all experienced. In the 1960s and 70s, American urban planners started to create these planned cities. And there are a few near where I live. For example, there's Columbia, Maryland, Reston, Virginia. Have you looked at these planned cities and were they successful? I know a little bit about Reston. I've not been there, but I saw a film about it. And I think... I don't know. I'd have to go and ask the residents. I can't speak on their behalf, and I wouldn't want to. Um, I think there are certain qualities about Reston that I think would be very appealing as a place to live. It has access to water. It has a lot of green space. It looks very walkable. There seems to have been a driver to make it very diverse and inclusive. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, The film I saw was made, you know, several years ago. Um, So, without really seeing these neighborhoods, I'd be wary of giving my opinion. What about the kind of mixed-use development that seems to be popping up now so that people can live in a place that is sort of urban, but you've got stores and storefronts and places to sit and, and commune with people? Is that part of what you're advocating for? Absolutely. And we do address that in the book. And there's a ton of evidence, scientific evidence, to show that mixed use And actually, higher density urban living fosters all sorts of benefits for mental health, social health, physical health. Um, So, my neighbourhood that I live um, when I'm not in Charlottesville is in Edinburgh. It's south side Edinburgh. I have access to everything I need, really, within a 15, 20-minute walk. And Scotland is one of the first countries in the world to actually advocate for the 15 and 20-minute city. And it's doing five or six case studies of cities in Scotland and trying to implement that plan. I know it's become slightly controversial. I don't quite know why. I don't understand what the controversy is about. It seems to be very sensible. If you can drop your child off at a nursery or school within walking distance or a quick bus route from home and then go to your office within that neighbourhood, get your food, your provisions your exercise within that neighborhood, it makes a lot of sense to me. And the country I'll just cite, or a city I'll cite, sorry, that's doing this very well is Barcelona. And the example we use in the book is a super block. And that's an idea of a a series of blocks um, in which traffic has been reduced. Everything that you need is available in that neighborhood. I grew up near the ocean, and I lived for almost two decades on a lake that was actually less than 10 miles from downtown D.C. And I called looking out on the water every day my lake therapy. In the book, you talk about the importance of blue spaces. What is it? What is going on in our brains when we're near water that is so good for our mental health and well-being? 
those four attributes I mentioned earlier, fascination, extent, compatibility, and being away, water provides that in abundance. I think the other thing that makes water so restorative is it's a dynamic quality. It moves and it changes its patterns. It changes its sound as it flows over different kinds of surfaces. It changes in response to light falling on it. Um, and over it so it changes in response to daylight and season so it's much more dynamic i mean yes vegetation and trees are dynamic in that they are changing seasonally too but water is super dynamic and it's one of the most restorative attributes but access has become limited a lot of cities have turned their back on the river you see new york now it's facing the river it's 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 got parks and access both in Brooklyn and in Manhattan, you know, it's, it's engaging with the water in a way that perhaps it didn't in the past. I've seen other cities now turning to their waterfronts to increase access. It's super important. I think one of the issues with water also, though, has become safety. A lot of parents have a lot of concerns about access to water for children, but it can be designed sustainably and safely. There are techniques. What are you working on now? What are the questions that you're trying to answer that uh, you haven't dealt with uh, up until this point in your research? So I'm working on a sequel to Restorative Cities, and it's called Restorative Architecture, and it's the exact same hypothesis uh, that how we design our interiors and our architecture can really support mental health and urban design. And I'm working in the same way. The way that I work is I look at all the scientific evidence. Um, it takes a very, very long time to synthesize it. It's thousands of studies. And I translate that evidence into very simple principles, both for designers, but also for communities and lay people to use, for people in policy. And I work with an illustrator to make that scientific data very graphic and easily understandable. And it's a big project. Uh, it's going to be very a very similar style of book, but focusing on interiors rather than urban design. Can you give us any clues as to what you're learning now? And it's only interiors, not the exterior buildings, but but interiors or both? It's both. It's it's like I would say it's it's the space between buildings and the buildings themselves, and it's dealing with a whole host of design attributes that we touched upon in restorative cities, but it's going into a lot more detail. So things like color, pattern, fractals, textiles, light, sound, the form of space. So a lot more in terms of architectural design attributes. And not to you know blow your whole story, but are there cities that you're seeing now that have some of these attributes? I mean, what, where are you focusing uh, your, your research right now? So that's a good question because I just actually spent Friday of last week really doing some deep research into case studies. And I've got to say, some of them are coming from Europe. I'm going to Helsinki and Stockholm in uh, August to do some research. And there are some wonderful examples there of libraries and public buildings that have extraordinary um, commitment to quality design. And I know that they exist here in the US, but I I do find Europe is my kind of bed of, of, of exemplars just because I know it much better. But I'd, I'd welcome examples from your listeners. All right. Well, this is very interesting. I want to thank you so much for spending time talking to me today. Well, thank you uh, for your interest. And I really hope it's engaged your audience. I think it will. You can find previous episodes of Speaking of Psychology on our website at www.speakingofpsychology.org or on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. If you have comments or ideas for future podcasts, you can email us at speakingofpsychology at apa.org. Speaking of Psychology is produced by Lee Weinerman. Our sound editor is Chris Kondayan. Thank you for listening. For the American Psychological Association, I'm Kim Mills.